So like many African politicians, you know, they care a lot about elections. They want to be able to control the news and the media. And when these social media platforms from outside the country gaining so much ground, they become harder to control. So the government needs to rein them in through either licenses or through certifications or through regulations and guidelines. Most African countries, when it comes to the concerns that the United States raises about Chinese tech companies, We've talked about Huawei a lot on this show. Most Africans go, you know what? That's just not our problem. That's not our fight. But on TikTok, the Kenyans seem to be having second thoughts a little bit. Unemployment is still African society's most pressing issue. So so the idea of not training people but rather bringing in robots is going to be very unpopular, I think. But I can definitely see also, you know, kind of why a, a factory owner might make that decision. Boomplay is a transin initiative. It's a joint venture with NetEase. It's Africa is the only major market in the world that I know of where Spotify and Apple are getting their butts kicked by somebody else in terms of streaming music. And Boomplay is the one that's doing that. And they've held on as well. Talk to us a little bit about Boomplay and why they have been able to be successful, whereas in everywhere else around the world, Music streaming is dominated by Spotify and Apple. The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at AfricaChinaReporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by CGSP's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, it's been a while since we've had a chance to talk about the tech sector in Africa and China's role in the tech sector. It came up last week, and it was a story that I wished we had actually devoted more coverage to in our daily news segments, but we just it kind of just got by me with all the stuff that's going on in the South China Sea and Pakistan. We just unfortunately couldn't fit it in. But the 2024 China-Africa Internet Development and Cooperation Forum that took place in Xiamen, which is in southeastern China, right across from Taiwan. So if you put Taiwan on a map, right across that little Taiwan Strait waterway, there's Xiamen. By the way, Kobus, if you haven't been to Xiamen, it is absolutely lovely down there. I've been there a couple of times. And, and so these 400 participants from 20 African countries who took part in the forum were very lucky to go to such a beautiful place. And I can understand why they went. But it was an interesting discussion that took place in Xiamen. And you know, the, the Chinese put together these China-Africa forums. There was the Think Tank Forum, which you wrote about. And obviously in the run-up to FOCAC, which is the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit that's gonna take place later, I think in, they're saying October, November of this year, we're gonna see a lot of these China-Africa mini forums that are happening. But I still think it's interesting because that these conversations are taking place at all is really important, in part because you and I follow this space very closely, and I don't get the sense that these same types of conversations are happening in other parts of the world about Africa and not happening in Africa enough as well. Now, the most interesting takeaway, and I'd like to get your take on this, that I thought about when I was watching this forum, and I got to watch the live stream a little bit, is how the discussion about Chinese tech in Africa has changed over the past 10 to 15 years. You remember in previous shows when we've talked about this topic, the focus has been on hardware, infrastructure, connectivity. And in many parts of Africa, particularly in urban Africa, that's not an issue anymore. There's pretty good bandwidth in large parts of the continent, lots of connectivity. I remember you and I could barely do a show with somebody from Nigeria in you know maybe 2015, 2016. And today, we can do a video show. It's no problem. And so it was interesting to see this transformation where they're no longer talking about tech and hardware, but they're talking about tech 
and governance. And in fact, the final communique called for better representation of developing countries in global governance of the technology sector, specifically from UN bodies. And that got me thinking about what you've been talking about in many years in terms of China's desire to have more influence in what you call norm setting. And so this transition from hardware to norm setting, that to me was the big takeaway from this forum. Yes, and that evolution comes with a second one, which is the move towards AI. You know, so obviously China is really pushing its own version of AI, and it's also pushing norm setting and governance around AI, or its own vision of it. So it was very interesting to see China-Africa AI policy dialogue and cooperation mechanism, for example, being raised, you know, kind of in the communique. And clearly there is a drive from China for norm setting internet and, and, and tech norm setting more generally, but also now increasingly AI norm setting. And that's going to be very interesting because, you know, AI hasn't really been discussed in the in the Africa-China space very much. But it'll be interesting to see, you know, which way they go. But clearly, overall, China's really interested in having its vision of what the internet is and what the internet could be, you know, kind of a dominant one in the global south. I'm so glad you brought up that question of AI because right now only seven African countries have drafted national AI strategies and not one country on the continent has implemented any kind of formal regulation of AI. Now, you talk about this internet governance vision that the Chinese have, and I just think it's important to lay that out in terms of the contrast with what the U.S. has. Now, let's not say the West here, because Europe's vision and the U.S. vision are very different on internet governance. In fact, Europeans are are much stricter and in many ways a little bit closer to the Chinese vision. The U.S. talks about a free and open internet, where there's no restrictions and you know it should be a global thing whereas the chinese talk about internet sovereignty that each country should be able to set its own rules it's rather ironic kobis though that the united states now with the tiktok debate is actually implementing very similar rules to what the chinese do and they say we should be able to restrict certain apps and that very much is in line with chinese internet sovereignty doctrine. So just a a little bit of irony there. But let's quickly kind of talk about hardware because it still is important, even though folks are talking about governance at these kinds of forums. We got some numbers that show Transin. And Transin, again, for those of you who don't live in Africa, Southeast Asia, South Asia, or the Middle East, is probably the largest phone company that you've never heard of. They make just incredibly successful phones. And Kobus, you're going to get a kick out of this. So here are the latest numbers from fourth quarter 2023. We haven't gotten the first quarter 2024 yet, but Transcend Phones, Techno, Infinix, and Itel accounted for 48% of the smartphone market in Africa. Techno alone had 26%. Wow. I think that's just remarkable how after 10 years or so that these guys have been able to hold that commanding height of the smartphone market in a sector that's changing so fast. And get this, Techno's smartphone shipments last year, just Techno, grew by 77%. I mean, these guys are doing something right, there's no doubt. I mean, it's amazing. What's also really interesting for me is that no one is kind of copying their model, it seems. Because transient success on on very low margins, you know, and kind of adapting to African consumers and so on, like those points have been made for several years in a row now. Like people have been making those same remarks about transient success and no one is copying them. And meanwhile, transient is just going from strength to strength. So it's really interesting that, that there isn't more competition developing in this market. Yeah, and there is in other parts of the world. So here in Vietnam, Transcend's now coming into the market, also in South Asia as well. Samsung and a number of the other Chinese competitors are out there. And by the way, Xiaomi is also going after some of Transcend's markets in Africa as well. So we might see some competition there. Other news that came out this week before we get into our discussion with Benjamin Dada from BenjaminDada.com, who I'm going to introduce shortly. Huawei Cloud recently initiated a program in Nigeria that's going to commit $10 million dollars in cloud credits to assist 100 Nigerian startups over the next two years. Cloud-based hosting, especially for AI and very data-intensive projects, very expensive. So it's nice to see actually some more venture capital coming into the tech sector. So let's get a perspective about this tech sector, particularly in Nigeria. And again, I mentioned that Benjamin Dada, he's joining me today on the show. I had a chance to speak with him earlier, and I wanted to kind of just get a pulse check 
of where we are right now in the China Africa tech space. And he just did a fantastic job of laying it all out. So let's take a listen now to my discussion with Benjamin Dada. Benjamin Dada, welcome to the show. Great to speak with you. Thanks for having me, Eric. It's nice to be connected. It's wonderful to have you. There's a lot of ground that I want to cover with you today. I want to first start with Let's Chat. Let's Chat was this app that seemed like it would be perfect for the African market. It was built by ByteDance, the Chinese company behind TikTok. So it had that algorithm mojo behind it. I mean, they're really just perfect for it because of what they've done with TikTok. ByteDance had also been working in some of the aggregator sites in Africa. So they knew the market pretty well. Let's Chat was about talking and messaging and things that teenagers in Africa would love to do. And yet it didn't work. Why did Let's Chat fail in your view? So I think the first thing is I'm a bit wary of saying something failed because I'm not privy to the objective. Well, they closed it, so it didn't work. Yes. But that said, I think that the reason why they retreated on Let's Chat is maybe one, it did not meet some of their, let's say, user targets. And one of that user target might be maybe they wanted to have the same level of engagement as a Facebook messenger or ambitiously, maybe a WhatsApp, right? But I don't think what the market in Africa truly needed at this point is another messaging or social app. Some of the things that Let's Chat was trying to dangle as carrots to increase its value proposition was, say, sponsored data. So you can use Let's Chat without paying through your data. So it's true that, you know, data cost in Africa is more expensive than, you know, the average uh, in, in the world. But what you find is many of the incumbents like Meta, they've invested so much in, one, bringing down the cost of using their platform. So, you know, they had Facebook lights, you know, they separated Messenger from the main Facebook app. You know, there's been a lot of experimentation from the incumbents and the dominant social media players on how to maximize the limited bandwidth and data accessibility that Africans had, that somebody just bringing all oh, free data services wasn't going to be enough. And if you take that same lens, you know, let's start, if you did video, YouTube yeah. already experimented with something called YouTube Go. And YouTube Go was like a low, lightweight, less data consuming version of YouTube that, you know, Google was piloting at the time, say 2018, right? And, you know, all of that has been the driving principle for this incumbent targeting the next billion users with people in Africa. So if you're let's chat and you're doing something in trying to drop the cost of data or trying to make it zero rise, I don't think that's going to be enough. Then you think about distribution. Again, the likes of Facebook, the likes of Google, they have this very close knit partnerships team with OEMs. So I used to intern at Google in like 2017. So I think I saw a bit on the inside. Right. So there is an Android partnerships team. There's another partnerships team for YouTube. There's another partnerships team for X, Y, Z. And, you know, being partnered with these original equipment manufacturers means that you can preload your apps on the phones so that the end users don't need to download it. Because I know from behavioral studies, many African users are very skeptical about downloading new apps. And this is because of the space constraint on their phone. So almost everybody always has a memory card, right? So these guys have already done all these partnerships, even with like Transition and with like Samsung. Google had a stronger advantage because they own the Android OS and they could just throw in some incentives and stuff. So I think, you know, from a distribution point of view, the incumbents dominated the market. But, but surprising, because, though, that ByteDance, given their presence in Africa with TikTok, didn't have those same OEM relationships. And given the fact that Transon, also being a Chinese company that often does business with other Chinese companies, didn't adopt Let's Chat the same way that they have, say, other Chinese apps. 100%. I think that was one of the conundrums that, you know, I saw. Like, if you're a Chinese company and you have a fellow Chinese company that is doing very well in Africa, I think Transition now is about 48% of the market with three devices leading the way, right? And you are ByteDance, you know, you have the clout 
in other markets you have the other flagship apps like tiktok you know there's so much that could be explored so i don't know really what could have happened why that wasn't explored maybe that wasn't their go-to-market approach or maybe the founders did not like each other or maybe i, I don't know what what could have really happened that it wasn't explored so it would be nice to hear from them you know. Yeah, who knows? It would be interesting. And let me just give you a, a perspective on some of the numbers that you were referencing. So at the time that Let's Chat launched, somewhere in early, I think, 2022, their monthly average users peaked at 440,000, which sounds okay. But by the time that they shut the business, they were down to 83,000. And when you compare that to, as you talked about, Meta's Facebook at 170 million and WhatsApp at 146 million in Africa, the numbers are not even close. So you can kind of see that it just didn't take off. And it really didn't take off beyond Nigeria either. They launched in West Africa and most of the uptick was in West Africa. But we're talking about ByteDance. So let's chat didn't work, but TikTok is definitely working. Give us a perspective on TikTok today in Africa. Yes. So like TikTok, I say is the closest competitor now to Google search. You know, many young people in Africa go to TikTok to search for things in the way they went to Instagram to search for e-commerce related things. So people go to TikTok to find even new music. People go to TikTok to create content that they could monetize. People go to TikTok to consume content as well, right? So yes, TikTok is something that is really thriving at the moment from where I see it. And I'm like, hmm, what could they have done? Should they have tried to expand TikTok to have, you know, maybe some of the less chat capabilities? Maybe that would have helped. But, you know, I don't know. Again, many of these companies always roll out new products as experiments for bigger products. So like I, like I referenced, YouTube Go, Project Mango then was an experiment for the main YouTube. So the plan was if they concluded the experiment, they could absorb it into the main YouTube. Same thing with like some other browser lights versions, right? I don't know what their plan was. I feel like also they launched in 2019. The product, yes, was failing, but I think they've not been around long enough to deem it a total failure. So look at Facebook. Facebook in... Nigeria, at least in 2016, it was, I think, peaking or growing very fast, but they had launched way before then in Nigeria. So I think that if they had given it more time and then they relooked at their go-to-market strategies, explored more partnerships, I just don't feel like they were committed enough to less chat growth in, in the country. But TikTok, on the other hand, is doing very well. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but like from what I see from the screenshots of TikTok posted on Twitter or from the screenshots or the videos of TikTok posted on WhatsApp statuses, right? It looks like, you know, the platform is really making a name for itself on the continent. Oh, there's no doubt. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, the median age in Africa is 19.4 years old. Yeah. TikTok is perfectly suited for teens and for young people. In fact, there were some statistics that came out in Kenya that 60% uh, of the population there gets their news more from TikTok than anywhere else. Now, Kenya is interesting an interesting case study here because most African countries, when it comes to the concerns that the United States raises about Chinese tech companies, we've talked about Huawei a lot on this show, most Africans go, you know what, that's just not our problem. That's not our fight. But on TikTok, the Kenyans seem to be having second thoughts a little bit. So back in March, Kenya is demanding that TikTok prove that it's adhering to local privacy and user verification laws, and they are threatening to crack down, even potentially ban the app. Now, a lot of people say them banning the app is just politics in the legislature. They're not really going to do it. But there is a concern in Kenya about the spread of propaganda, fraud, and also the availability of sexualized content on the platform and the lack of content moderation there. Are those concerns in Kenya unique to Kenya, or do you see other African countries also have those same worries about TikTok and the way that it disseminates information? It's an interesting topic. So I don't think they're unique to Kenya. If you look at Nigeria, we have Nigeria Data Protection Regulation, right? So yes, in this part of the world, we're actively thinking about our version of GDPR or just something that protects our data. And this is because, yes, one, Many of our legislators are being clued on the fact that data is the new competitive advantage, 
right? Anybody that controls the data, you know, can do so much with it. So, for instance, they can spread the propaganda that will affect their elections, which they care about the most. So, like many African politicians, you know, they care a lot about elections. They want to be able to control the news and the media. And when these social media platforms from outside the country gaining so much ground, they become harder to control. So, the government needs to rein them in through either licenses or through certifications or through regulations and guidelines. So I think definitely many African countries are beginning to look at their data as precious. And of course, maybe not because of the altruistic purpose, but more for like how they can control it in the future, right? But the second thing I see is that, yes, there will be some level of protectionism for their homegrown products right but the problem now is i'm not seeing any homegrown competitor to a tiktok so like there's no made in nigeria or made in kenya app that has had so much traction or that has shown the dedication to compete with a tiktok so in that sense i'm like yes the only thing you could possibly be protecting right now is maybe your own propaganda as an African government and yes, maybe your data because, you know, you want to use it as a source of negotiation on the global stage. But like we need to see more homegrown platforms that are trying to tackle or rival these players. If not, even if you ban or even if you ban apps, your constituents will use VPNs to access these apps because it has become part of their livelihood. So take a case in point, X was banned. In fact, Twitter then was banned in Nigeria. And for one, I use the VPN to access Twitter because, you know, most of my following is on Twitter. Most of where I get my news, most of how I disseminate information is on Twitter. So I think the government needs to use a holistic approach to regulating these global media giants. And yes, data privacy is one leg by which they're approaching it. But I think there's still a lot more that they need to do and see to bring this to where they want it to be. But do you really think that an African country, and this is not even just a question that I would pose talking about Africa, but any country can build an app that rivals Meta's Amazon's, you you know, Google's and and TikTok, because the amount of money that it takes to launch a social network is in the billions of dollars. And that's the the high billions, by the way, not the low billions. And so the capital just isn't there for countries. And again, this is not unique to Africa. The Germans aren't going to be launching a competitor. The French aren't going to be launching a competitor. Wealthy countries aren't going to be doing it. So that question feels like it's off the table, that there's going to be a rival app. That being said, What we have seen are apps specifically designed for the African market, mobile money, mobile payment apps that are incredibly useful. But social media seems like a different beast in that respect. I think social media, the hype cycle and like the time for you to gain all the network effects has sort of been missed, right? So if you look at all the successful companies, I think the latest one or the one that launched the last was Snapchat, you know, 2011, but Meta... 2004, Twitter, 2006. So apart from the capital needed to run this, you know, the green field needed to, you know, start, expand, acquire market share and, you know, drive network effects to make it useful to future users. You know, I think we've sort of missed that train. But then people are looking at AI or whatever the next technology that will be as revolutionary to inspire the next hype cycle or to inspire the next wave. So we will see what can be built. But yes, that's where the question of capital, because even AI processing costs a lot of money. So, I mean, I just feel like at this point, we might have to be consumers in a lot of ways or else we'll be limiting ourselves to our own country. So imagine an app that is built for just Nigeria, you know, a social media app and stuff. You know, we've seen some clowns try to play around with things like that, but... Of course, there's no serious commitment or political will. It's really hard to do. You mentioned Transin, and Transin is the phone company that a lot of people in Africa know about, now increasingly here in Southeast Asia. So in Vietnam, we have Transin phones, Techno, Itel, and Infinix phones as well, and they're making a play in India. But outside of Asia and Africa, and to some extent the Middle East as well, nobody knows about Transin, yet for about 10 plus years, these guys have ruled the African mobile phone market almost from the start. So they came in on 
you know, flip phones, these analog phones, and which, by the way, still sell quite robustly in many African countries. They then dominated into the smartphone market. We just got the new numbers that came out. And again, you pointed out 48% of the market. That is incredible for the amount of time that they have been doing this and holding on to their space atop the pile. Yep. What is Transcend Secret in your view? Why are they so successful and have been so successful? It's a good question. I, I would say one reason I think Transcend is successful is because there is no other large player that was serious about this market. Samsung wasn't serious about the market? They are not large enough. If Facebook, for instance, had built an OEM at the time Transcend was beginning to gain ground in Africa, I would wager that Facebook would have provided more competition for Transcend. I think for Transcend, from the get-go, their target market was, oh, one, we'll build low-end to middle-end phones. And, you know, where could they find the audience? Africa and, you know, some other places. But Samsung was very comfortable with their U.S. markets and their developed country markets. So, you know, even though, yes, compared to like, okay, Google doesn't even have any presence. Samsung has some centers in Africa, but like, I don't think they had taken this space as seriously as they should have. And that's why they let that gap of low to middle end phones up for transition to take. So number one is, I feel like if someone like Facebook or even Google had invested at the right time with the right strategies in Africa, it would have provided sufficient competition for transition. I know Google tried to launch some kind of mid-end, low-end phone. They piloted it for like a year and they just shut it down. But yes, you know, we needed someone serious and with the right time to try this. But the second thing is, yes, Transition, when they came to Nigeria, they tried to understand the market a lot. So if you read some of their previous communications, talk about how they tailored their cameras for the dark skin, because all of these things, there's always like a core user segment Right. And if you are able to make it work well for that core user segment, then you would win. Every other person can just get on it. So if you build something for the U.S. audience, you're thinking more about, oh, these people will have access to a lot of Internet because Internet penetration is like 90 percent. These people will have access to good light thing. Right. Because maybe the skies are blue or whatnot. But if you're a transition and you've come to the market, you spend some time here and you are building things that are tailored to people's skin, you know, you could win. They were also clever enough to quickly bridge the gap between their low-end flip phones, which we call feature or dumb phones, and then the entry-level smartphones. If not, Samsung might have gone down faster than they could have come up, if you get what I mean. So yes, they started with feature phones, but you know when the highest price of a feature phone, let's say, is 10,000 Naira, the entry price of a smartphone then becomes 11,000. So like, it feels like a natural spectrum for someone who was tired of you know pressing buttons to to have their first taste of of a smartphone because before then Africa had a lot of sharing of phones instead of ownership of phones so i think you know the reason why transition is successful is cuz they really really committed to the market they built things that were tailored for this market they also like try to bridge the gap and sort of eke out a space for themselves before the nearest competitors could come in. And then the third thing I'll say is like value added services. So now we have Transition invested in other software services. And I know, you know, that's something you're also excited about, but yes, they brought in value added services that, you know, even if you're not using Transition for just the OEM, you can consider them for the bundle they offer you. So I think that is great. Of course, all the marketing involved, cost of acquisition involved, influencers, ETC, trying to make it look cool. You know, you have Davido, who is like one of the biggest influencers in Africa using a techno or using some of all their devices. You know, that's definitely going to win love from fans and from people on the continent. But yes, that's where I leave it for this. I guess I'm just surprised because here in Vietnam, where I live, in many ways is about the middle way in terms of GDP for most African countries. So half of Africa is wealthier than Vietnam, half is poorer. And what we're seeing here in Vietnam is that Samsung has made a huge play in the low end of the market. 
And so it surprises me that Transcend has been able to hold on. But maybe part of the reason that they've been successful is not only because of the hardware, which you talked about how they optimized their AI for darker skin complexions. They also made it dust proof. They made the battery life longer because of power. Yeah, Multi-SIM features. D yeah, yes. multiple SIMs. So a lot of that before Samsung and others were able to do it. So people built a certain degree of brand loyalty. That being said, this question of the apps is also very important. And a lot of people don't know that Transin has a venture fund called Future Hub, where they literally will go out and invest millions of dollars into African startups. And then just like any venture capital fund, you know, they'll place 100 bets for a payoff. But those four are big. Palm Pay is one of them that they've done. That's done very well. The other one I want to ask you about is Boomplay. Boomplay is a Transin initiative. It's a joint venture with NetEase. It's Africa is the only major market in the world that I know of where Spotify and Apple are getting their butts kicked by somebody else in terms of streaming music. And Boomplay is the one that's doing that. And they've held on as well. Talk to us a little bit about Boomplay and why they have been able to be successful, whereas in everywhere else around the world, music streaming is dominated by Spotify and Apple. So I think the Bloomplay example is a classic of what less chat could have been if they were preloaded on a transform. Uh, I was the preloading you're uh, saying is the big issue. That was the advantage that Boomplay had. Interesting. Yes. And so like that's that's number one. And number two is the pricing or like the payment method, right? Boomplay allowed Nigerians to pay in Naira. Many of the other apps, they take time before they allow the local payment options, right? So that's the localization angle to that. And then I think the third thing is just still the marketing, right? So you show a musician using Bloom Play to listen to music or, you know, something like that, then you, you get people curious. But that preloading functionality is definitely a big mover because of the convenience and because you just feel like it's not part of your storage count. You'd rather use it than install something else, etc. So that's the key reason why I think Boomplay would have succeeded this much in, in this market. Well, it was also this issue of the first mover advantage that they focused on the Africa market long before the others did, went around to the music companies and said, we'd like to do rights deals with you. And a lot of the big international music companies didn't pay much attention to Africa, gave the rights away or sold them to Boomplay at much lower rates before Apple and Spotify had come in. But Boomplay locked them up. The other thing that Boomplay's done more recently, again, I'm surprised that Apple and Spotify didn't go this way, is they looked at Francophone Africa. And French-speaking Africa is a big part of what Boomplay does. And Boomplay now, by the way, is looking to overseas diaspora markets in New York, in London, in Paris, in Brussels, where there's large Francophone populations. So very interesting strategies on that front. We've been talking about traditional tech when we think about the Chinese, hardware, apps, things like that. That's kind of old news in Africa because it's been around for a decade or more. The new tech that's coming in from China has four wheels and a steering wheel. Talk to us a little bit about EVs that are really starting to make their presence felt across the continent. China sees a huge opportunity here to, to again, be that first mover, much like Boomplay and Transon were 10 years ago. They're doing the same thing with cars. You cover cars quite a bit, especially EVs at uh, Bendada. Tell us a little bit about the trend of Chinese EVs in Africa. Yeah, so like you see, the thing we, with cycles is when a new quote-unquote toy or trend comes around, consumers want to get their hands on it, right? Until we find out why it wouldn't work for us. So I'll give you an example. There's, um, let's say Tesla, right? Tesla is an electric vehicle, but from the US. And, you know, there'll be a handful of people you find on the major bridges in Lagos, Nigeria, you know, commercial capital, driving Teslas. And but they're really rich though, right? I mean, they're really rich. And then people are just wondering, like, it's such a status symbol, right, that everybody is then aspiring towards it. But then it's expensive. It won't definitely have factored in some of the nuances of this market, right? So, for instance, the roads would have potholes. So how is the navigation system of the car designed to beat potholes or to like navigate it properly? Secondly, is the electricity needed to charge the car? Is the car 
compromising on some features to make sure there's a long battery life and, and stuff like that. But we see the guys from Shenzhen, you know, BYD, Build Your Dreams. They are making an entry into Africa and I think they are choosing their battles, right? So if you go to a Rwanda, Kigali, you are less likely to spot potholes on the roads, right? Than maybe you go to like uh, Lagos, right? And I think if a company from China says they want to build for a particular market, they have the know-how now. They have the, will I say, community. So this is other Chinese companies that have played in the space and can guide them either through to the governors or the policymakers or to other supply chain partners. You know, they have the community now to really, really look at the African markets and figure out what would work. So make no mistake, Africans are interested in EVs because it looks like a nice to have, but there are some things that are keeping us from it, right? And I think when these Chinese people who have the capital, who have the experience and who have the political will to get it done are ready for us, I think it would be a no-brainer to use a Chinese product than to use a U.S. product. Yeah, but you can imagine in Africa where petrol prices are often very high in many places, and yet this is a region that is abundant in sunshine, that the matching up of solar and electrified transportation makes a lot of sense. And we're not only talking about cars here, but let's talk about the entire transportation chain from scooters to tricycles, and what I mean tricycles, I mean what farmers use to move things around. Also, throughout many African countries now, we're seeing delivery trucks that are electrified from the Chinese. In Kenya, we've got Basigo, which are buses. Also in Zimbabwe, there are buses as well, which are electrified from BYD. Yes. And so the entire value chain on transportation, on electrified transportation, the Chinese seem to be hitting. There's a company in Ghana called Solar Taxi, which I absolutely love. They're bringing in Chinese cars, and they're bringing in Chinese solar panels and they're in selling the cars and the solar panels to people as a package. And I think that is just so innovative to me. And that seems to be solving real problems there. Yes. So that's what I was saying to you about like having that community now that could help you complement your value chain. So even a BYD or any other car maker or automobile maker coming into this space can easily tap on products or the services of another company in that value chain to deliver a bundle that would make sense. Even when you think about financing, right? Imagine if, I don't know, you tap on a pound pay. I don't know if pound pay's license allows them to do lending because I think they are mobile money. But yes, you'll be able to tap on the people within your community to make sure that the issues or the barriers to adoption you know, is something that you can lower significantly and then you let the market determine your next steps. So 100%, like, you know, I'm not surprised that the guys you mentioned are partnering to offer up, you know, solar panels alongside their cars. It's, it's the way to go. The final thing I'll say on that point is also like the care centers and the spare parts, right? So one of the reasons why Transition was successful with phones is because they had set up a care center called Cow Care. And, you know, people felt like, oh, if my phone spoils, I can easily walk into Computer Village, which is like a hub of everything phone and accessories in Lagos. I think that has been demolished now and it's been relocated somewhere else. But yes, you know, setting up care centers for EVs and stocking it with parts and everything will definitely move the needle for many Africans, you know, who are familiar with branches from, from banks and, you know, fiscal touch points. And those care centers from Transon, by the way, out here in Asia and also in Africa are also places where people can go to recycle their phones. They can drop them off and get a coupon for a new phone. And that's very important for Africa, too, because Africa is a dumping ground now for e-waste. And so in terms of reducing the amount of electronic waste that goes into the environment or that is shipped from other parts of the world to Africa is also very important. So I think what Transon's doing there deserves a little bit of credit. Uh, very quickly, just last question. When we look ahead now, going forward into 2024, 20, 25, what are some of the trends that you're seeing that the Chinese may be a part of? Again, we talked about EVs, we have obviously apps and things like that. What should people focus on in terms of the Chinese going forward in your view? If you look at the top 10 most valuable companies in the world, I think China is now taking up at least three of those. So startups in Africa 
is another space that we are seeing a lot of Chinese interest. So there are some venture capital funds, you know, who have set up shop in Africa and are, and are investing in the continent. Some of them have also partnered with other local GPs or local investment firms to, to run their operations. So one thing I want people to definitely pay attention to is Chinese investment into startups in Africa. Unfortunately, we've also been hit badly by the funding winter, right? And if you look at the numbers from the last quarter, funding declined by 51%. But I think patient capital, like the type from the Chinese, could definitely outlast this kind of drought and could produce some winners for them. So that's one space I want people to pay attention to. The second thing is, you know, what we've already discussed, EVs and new tech. I think AI would also be a space that the Chinese would definitely want to play in. Either AI as a standalone offering or AI embedded within other offerings. So what do I mean? So you can invest in AI within a financial services company or within a fraud solution. So you, you create funds, funds for AI enabled companies, or you can invest in AI as an infrastructure, right? So I think we should pay attention to new trends that the world is enjoying. That's one thing I think the Chinese always want to bring to Africa because they feel like they have the political will and the ecosystem to make that happen. Benjamin Dada is the founder of BenjaminDada.com. And this is one of the best tech websites anywhere. But if you are interested in what's going on in Africa, this must be on your list. You can follow him on all the social channels. And then I'll put a link in the show notes to the site. You can sign up for their newsletters. They've got funding trackers, career advice, investors corners. It's a fantastic tech site for African news. So I, I just cannot recommend it enough. They also cover quite a bit of what the Chinese are doing in Africa. So Benjamin, thank you again for your time and your insights. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for spotlighting us and for you know reading our work. It means a lot to me and the team. Kobus, Benjamin is the kind of guy that you would love to meet with a bottle of wine and an evening and you could go for three or four hours just ask him so many questions. He is so well briefed on all these issues. It's just absolutely incredible. We didn't have time to get to a very important part of the story, which I'd like to raise here with you is the fact that so often when we talk about Chinese tech in Africa, we still focus on the consumer side of the business. Yet where I think a lot is happening is on the industrial side, agriculture, manufacturing. This is where Chinese tech in Africa to me is having a maybe it's hard to measure, but I feel in many ways having a much more transformative impact. So things like, for example, Huawei 5G in coal mines, things like Chinese tech now powering charging stations, powering logistics vehicles for Woolworths, which is a, uh, a supermarket and uh, department store chain in South Africa. We're talking about Chinese drones and agricultural tech boosting farm yields. This is where so much of it's happening, but it's happening out of sight. It doesn't seem to attract the attention of the press, and also people just don't talk about it as much. But it comes back down to this point that you've raised over and over again, not only about, say, weapons or other types of technologies, but it's the accessibility that the Chinese tech is affordable. They're set up in Africa with service centers, and much of the tech is already tailored for developing countries in terms of pricing and functionality, much like Transin was with their phones. Yes. And I think also what comes with that is a willingness to consider Africa as a potential market by Chinese companies. So I think for a lot of their competitors in other parts of the world, Africa, it never occurs to them that, that Africa might, you know, kind of have this potential. But I think for, you know, kind of a lot of like the Chinese sector is already pretty used to that concept and they've already set themselves up in Africa to a certain extent, you know, many of them have. So some of those relationships already exist. So now if one is, if one is interested in, for example, agricultural technology, then one can just simply move in that direction. Whereas I think in a lot of other kind of providers just haven't built that kind of like structure or those connections network in the market, I think. I think it's interesting because the perception many European and US boardrooms probably is the margins just aren't there. And this is a little bit why 
Tesla isn't going into the low end of the market with a $25,000 car, and yet Xiaomi launched the Su7, which is now in that $30,000 range. The Chinese are comfortable in these low margin environments, whereas I think American, Korean, Japanese, and Europeans would like in their tech sector to be in much higher margin environments. But Transon has shown us that you can make a lot of money in Africa. And when Transon went public on the Shanghai Star Exchange, it had a valuation of seven and a half billion dollars, mostly based on its business in Africa. And so there is money to be made in the African consumer market and especially in the industrial market as well. And so I just think that there's these perceptions that out there that aren't necessarily backed by fact, but they're just feelings left over from, I don't know, from these, these rumors that have been circulating for decades. It's a lot like the risk premiums that we've talked about with investors as well, that at the end of the day, when you look at the data, Africa is not actually riskier in many respects than other parts of the world. Yeah, it's a form of narrative more than necessarily kind of objective reality, I think. I just want to close on a discussion that I had with the Chinese scholar earlier this week to get your reaction to this. And he told me something very interesting that I never really thought about. And he's familiar with the African industrial space. And he said, China and Africa actually have a lot in common in terms of their demographics. And I was like, what? And uh, China's demographics are shrinking very fast. It's got labor shortages. Africa's demographics are booming, getting very large. But he pointed out that there also are labor shortages, particularly in skilled labor. So Chinese factories are now are becoming increasingly automated to make up for their labor shortages. And so we're seeing big data, machine learning, robotics all take over what used to be done by people. And he pointed out that there's a demand that he's seeing in some African countries for that same automation to make up for some of the skilled labor that uh, African countries lack in terms of manufacturing and industrial engineering and industrial processes, that some of the, the methods that they're using in China today can be and are being imported into certain parts of small-scale manufacturing in Africa. Very interesting to think about how totally divergent trends may actually come together to help one another. Yeah, it's very interesting. I can totally see that happening. It'll be interesting to hear more about which specific sectors, but I can also well imagine that there's going to be some kind of popular pushback against that once it becomes more broad-based in Africa, because obviously unemployment is still African society's most pressing issue. So the idea of not training people, but rather bringing in robots is going to be very unpopular, I think. But I can definitely see also, you know, kind of why a, a factory owner might make that decision. But think about the narrative. You talk about narratives. That, in many respects, I understand where it comes from, but it's potentially a very misguided narrative because the factory is not the only part of the supply chain that benefits from having that factory there. There is the electricity that's used, the food that people eat there. There is the, the trucks that ship the goods. There's the rails that use it. All that whole ecosystem of the supply chain benefits from having a factory there even if it only has 10% the number of workers that it would have had if it wasn't automated. So that, in many respects, is going to be up to the local governments to make sure that their people understand the benefits of having automated factories, even if they don't employ as many people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It'll be very interesting to also see which African countries, you know, really go for this, you know. Well, I would imagine that you'll probably see it first in the more advanced countries like Morocco that have already pretty well established auto manufacturing setups also in South Africa as well where you've, I mean, auto manufacturing is primed for this, obviously. Kind of robot-based auto assembly is already happening at large scale in South Africa. Exactly. And then also the Chinese are doing more assembly of technology. And so we're starting to see more in Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Kenya of assembling Chinese phones and Chinese tech. That could, parts of that process could probably be automated. And so if it can help attract more Chinese manufacturing to Africa because costs are lower, they don't have as many difficulties in hiring and then maintaining workforces. This could be interesting to see. Uh, that being said, here in Vietnam, one of the things that I hear from a lot of the factory owners is that they are looking to automate as quickly and fast as they possibly can. And it's rather scary for developing countries because that traditional pathway to development always went through light manufacturing. And automation has the risk of totally displacing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a huge issue. Yeah. Well, let's leave the conversation there. I want to thank 
Benjamin Dada again for his time. And if you haven't been to his site, I've got a link to it in the show notes. And of course, if these are topics that you're interested in, then we'd love for you to check out the great work that Cobus and the rest of the team are doing at the China Global South Project. We rely on your subscriptions to stay in business, and it is tough for a media business to stay afloat. There's no doubt. I'm not going to lie about it. This is a brutal business to be in. And we live maybe not month to month, but certainly year to year. And your support and our Patreon supporters make the difference. So we would be thrilled if you go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Try out a subscription. We've tried to keep the prices as affordable as possible to make them as accessible as possible. More importantly, we build the daily news brief and our coverage to make it more efficient for you to be able to keep on top of everything that's going on. The whole idea is you spend five minutes with us every day and you literally get what China's doing in Africa, Asia, the Americas, the Caribbean, all over the world. And so the idea is that we do all the hard work every day to filter through, to curate the news so you don't have to. And so it's a great service. We have thousands of diplomats and activists and scholars every day who read it, and we would love for you to join that fascinating global reader community that we have. Once again, chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Okay, let's leave it there. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afriquechine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.